So we started uh, letting people into the call. Uh, thanks so much, everyone who is joining us today, and I can see a lot of people still coming in. Um, before we jump in, just quickly to tell you that um, we're so happy to be doing these webinars at Sri uh, You know, where we are very keen to do a lot of outreach and education in general about various topics. Um, and so we actually used to have a lot of public talk in the Bangalore office in person uh, almost every week or every other week. But of course, none of that was possible given the pandemic, which is why we started doing this webinar series. And uh, so here we are now on our 22nd webinar and uh, still really uh, you know, encouraging to see so many people joining us for each one. So um, I'm going to stop sharing my screen now and introduce to you the speakers we have with us today, and I'm just so excited uh, to talk to them about an extremely important and relevant topic. Um, so today we have uh, Dr. Manish Anvi and Professor Pankaj Sikharia with us, and I'm just giving you a brief introduction to them. Uh, welcome both. Really happy you're here. Uh, so Dr. Manish Chandi works in the Andaman and Nicobar Islands, and he has for many years worked on the interface between communities and the natural environment. He completed his doctoral thesis in 2007, wherein he explored the impact of the 2004 earthquake and tsunami on the community sharing mechanisms in the Nicobar Islands. And he knows the place really well inside out and has closely interacted with a lot of the communities and families there. He is currently also associated with ANET or the Andaman and Nicobar Environment Team and is definitely one of the foremost resource people on everything related to Nicobar and has been an incredible mentor for me as well in my work there. Um, welcome, Manish. Thank you. Um, and we also have with us uh, Professor Pankaj Sikhsalya, who is keenly interested in interdisciplinary research and work that includes the social sciences, science and technology, media studies, and the environment, of course. He has been entwined in the happenings of Andhra and Nicobar Islands for several years, and apart from academic research, outreach, and conservation effort, is also an author of several books, including the including Instrumental Lives, Islands in Flux, The Last Wave, and I'm sure some of you would have come across these, especially if you have had an interest in the islands for some time now. So welcome both, and uh, let's jump right in. Um, so one question I'd like to ask you just from the outset of all of this is why should we be this worried and concerned about the Nicobar Islands? What is so special about the place? Why is it an area of importance? Um, maybe you could start with you, Manish. Okay. Okay. Am I, am I audible? Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, um, it's a good question. And I think an important question as well. Why should we, we be worried about what's happening? Or I wouldn't, more rather than saying worried, be concerned. Um, yes, there are two particularly important uh, reasons why. One is... Uh, for the local people who live on the, the islanders themselves, who live on the island. The other is, of the, I mean, of course, the fact that apart from the local people, there also is a local environment. And both these uh, two entities, so as to speak, who are island entities of the Andaman and Nicobar, and, and here we're talking about Nicobar Island in particular, uh, the environment or the, the, the local ecology itself is so pretty unique in very many ways and has benefited so many people in, in very many ways in terms of economics, in terms of being able to provide ecosystem services and so on. And the reason of being concerned is when you when we hear of this immense or drastic change that's being planned. Uh, and for those of us, uh, like many of us who are associated with the islands or even other places, when we hear of such developmental plans and you hear of the immense or the, the, the enormity of it all, then it sets off a, a, a set of concerns. That said, why are they doing this? Uh, or why are they planning to do something without having prior information or knowledge or even discussion with the local community, the local people? And what will happen to those habitats? What will happen to those species? What will happen to those, those services that people have been availing or benefiting from for many, many years? And so on. And um, from where one of the, the stances that I come from is, again, of local communities. And in terms of consultation, I know personally and clearly very uh, particularly so that the consultations have not been consultations at all. And that's a concern because when you're planning something 
uh, in a, in a, in a, any area being able to consult with and part, uh, discuss with the local communities as to what their aspirations and needs are and trying to meld a developmental program or a developmental ideology along with that and for the nation, national uh, needs, etc. Et I think is, a, is probably a way to go. And I don't really see any great hurry or a need to kind of push things down people's throat in such a manner as is being done in this case. But uh, I mean, we'll get into more details. So I, I'll stop there and let Pankaj uh, respond to as well. Yeah, I mean, I yeah, am I audible, Ishika? Fine, yeah, great, yeah. okay. So, I mean, in addition to Manish and absolutely, I might actually argue for an even more simpler and a more fundamental kind of logic is that we have to be concerned and we have to care because simply because Great Nicobar exists as it is. I mean, anything that is there uh, has value for itself and value in itself. And many of us who have had the opportunity of going to the islands or to that island, that particular island or any landscape or space that we you know, work in, uh, unless I, I would argue, unless there are very compelling reasons to intervene, there is no reason to intervene. And uh, this is a extremely rich uh, space uh, ecologically, like Manish mentioned, in terms of the human communities that have been there. And uh, I, I mean, geologically is a very interesting kind of uh, challenge and dimension. So while all the other values are there, I mean, because it exists and it is there, and it carries a lot of value in terms of the biological richness, for me, that, that is good enough. And if you, on the other end, if you compare and see, and we probably, like Manish said, we'll discuss it, what is proposed to be done and what the implications of that could be and whether what we will what we will gain or what we are promised we will gain, whether we will in any way gain that and what will be the cost of that, then that becomes a response to the interventions proposed. Uh, but I think there's a more fundamental kind of logic in my understanding why we have to be concerned about all of these and each one of these. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, um... Since you've started talking a little bit about what is going to happen there, uh, Pankaj, if you could continue and, you know, of course, we are gathered here today to look into some of these conservation worries and, you know, the anxiety that all of us have as people who have associated with the islands in some capacity or the other uh, with regard to what Niti Aayog has proposed for Great uh, Nicobar. So could you please tell us a little bit about that and exactly what we have, what, what can be expected? Yeah, sure. I mean, so uh, the one is that, you know, I've also been writing about that quite a bit. So now I've done a series of eight stories over the last five, six months. There's one that I've just done today that should appear in the wire tomorrow morning. This actually is about the opinion of the Wildlife Institute of India uh, agreeing to or justifying the denotification of the Galatia Bay Wildlife Sanctuary, which is in some sense is one of the key pivots of the concern that a lot of us have. There are many other smaller landscapes within that larger landscape. So uh, one way also for everybody, and maybe I can post those links in the chat here, or I can send it to Ishika and you can put it up. But uh, I mean, it might take a little bit of a, a, a sense of time to tell the story, but in, in very, very brief, there is a massive, massive project proposed in Great Nicobar. And I mean, there is another one in Little Andaman, but we won't discuss that now which is proposed, has been pivoted, piloted by the Niti Ayo. Uh, it is a 75,000 crore rupees proposed investment. And how it has come about, uh, if you have time, I can share some of what I know. You know. It does not come out as a clean process by which they have gone about doing that. But that is one dimension. I just focus on what is being proposed. Uh, so in March of this year, uh, there is Acom India Private Limited, which is a consulting company based in Gurgaon. Uh, they, were, they were kind of contracted by the Niti Aayog to put out a pre-feasibility report uh, for this uh, vision that the Niti Aayog has for uh, the Andaman and the Nicobar. And uh, ACOM has put out a 75,000 crore project, initial project for, Little, for, for, sorry, for Great Nicobar. It's a two-phase project. At the moment, they're talking about phase one, which includes a massive, massive port project in Galatia Bay. Uh, which is which we know was a wildlife sanctuary and one of the most important you know leatherback nesting sites in south asia for that matter and along with that 
there is an airport project, there is a power plant, of course, that's required, and there is a township project. So it is being proposed as an integrated uh, tourism and infrastructure project that will need 160 square kilometers of land on that island. Uh, that is in the proposed plan, and these documents are all available online. And uh, just for everybody's information, I've also put together a set of about 50, 60 documents, and uh, I'll be very happy to send it across. And I don't know if CWS can even put it up on their website. That's it'll be great. We can figure that out. But so these are all I'm talking from what's available in the public domain. 160 square kilometers. Along, if some of you know the geography of Great Nicobar, it's along the eastern coast and the southern coast. And if you look at that landscape, what you also realize is that this area is perhaps the most uh, easily accessible because this is the low-lying coastal areas. Most of the other parts of, the, of Great Nicobar, if I understand it right, are relatively not as low-lying, even along the coastline. Probably the gradients are much sharper. So we have 160 square kilometers of which nearly 130 square kilometers are uh, are not even uh, are kind of untouched, so to say. 30 square kilometers in that is revenue land where people already live, but the other area is uh, this this low lying coastal forest, uh, which uh, is is like I said, is spread across these four uh, kind of projects. And uh, I mean, I, I don't do ecological studies, but I think some of y'all would know, and perhaps y'all can confirm. I mean, this is this has this is home to some of the most diverse and you know large number of endemic species, which perhaps we are still discovering. New research projects are discovering more, both in terms of flora and fauna. This is a this is a coastline on which turtles are nesting. Uh, these are very unique forests, which are actually agreed to by the department and by the system itself. So it is just the scale of the whole thing, and it is kind of wrap up and and. You know, steamroll everything. Uh, and just one more point is to give the scale is, for example, what uh, Manish mentioned, today's population of Great Nicobar Island is 8,500 people. The total population of the entire Andaman and Nicobar Island is about 5 lakh on the higher side. And we know the challenges that islanders face at very basic levels, including, for example, drinking water. I mean, Port Blair, the capital, has serious issues, maybe once in three days in the taps if it's available. So it's not an easy place to kind of do all these things. Now the Great Nicobar proposal, and I'll finish here, for one island, uh, which today has 8,500 people, it has proposed six and a half lakh people to, to come and settle in this one single island in 30 years time. Okay. Now you can imagine what will happen to those forests, what will happen to the local people, whether they are the indigenous, the Shompen or the Nicobaris, or the settlers who have come. And where will this uh, resource come from? So the, the proposal itself says that all the raw material for construction of the port will have to be imported from mainland India, for example. And uh, so, so that is just one dimension of that. And I'll finish by giving another very concrete example of the concern. So, uh, the, so there's a justification given in the Wildlife Board minutes for the, for the denotification of the sanctuary which by the way was denotified before the proposal, formal proposal to locate the port here came about. Uh, so this is the process which is problematic. Now, there, there are maps or there are maps in the report which have actually out, laid out how the port will be built. So there are berths and of course a port construction will require breakwaters because you have to create tranquil waters for the ships to come in. And this port, uh, the bay is about three kilometers wide, right? Which is what the turtles are accessing to come, are uh, using to access the beaches. The port design proposing breakwater construction of about two and a half kilometers, leaving only a 300 meter point of entry for anybody to enter the bay. So what were three kilometers for the turtles, for instance, will become only 300 meters. So what is the chance that, and then there is so much traffic, there will be so much activity, so is it really going to be possible for the turtles to even access the beaches? Leave alone what will happen to the coastal system, the, the tidal systems, the accretion, the erosion, et cetera, et cetera. Now, it, it's, it's a kind of sounding of the death knell if two and a half kilometers of breakwater is to be built, that entire ecology of the bay is going to change or, or is likely to change. 
and that is uh, i mean that's one example of what we know of what they will do in 160 square kilometers uh, we don't know so that's really a quick wrap up and and if you have time and there is interest i can also share some of the other things but yeah, yeah definitely thank you for that answer i think uh, that sheds a lot of light on exactly what we have to expect here. Um, so, Manisha, I'm going to throw it back to you uh, and ask you a little more about what is the ultimate goal for what is being proposed here? Why is this development being targeted in Great Nicobar Island? And are these proposed activities even feasible or practical? Because it's also a place that, you know, we know is one that has taken a lot of time to be developed, even to the extent that it currently is, which is not a very highly urban setting. It's one which has you know, taken time to get to where it is currently. So how feasible is it for something of this scale to actually take place on the island? Okay, so, am I audible? I've taken out my headphones. Am I still audible? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, so to answer the, the first part of your question, which I think is, if I remember right, is why is this being done? Yeah, and yeah. second is, I mean, the second part of the parts of it is, is it feasible or not? Like what Pankaj has mm -hmm. already responded to. So yeah. I really can't um, fathom or kind of, I can't speak on the behalf of the Niti Aayog or the government as to why it was designed or why it is being proposed. But this is a, only an opinion and an inkling as to why it is being proposed. So I'm just going to share my opinion on, on, these, on this particular question. And from what I understand, like uh, Pankaj had earlier on highlighted saying, the island has only about approximately 8,000 odd people. And for an island of a large size, which is close to about 1,000 odd square kilometers, only 8,000 people living on it. It's, uh, I mean, from just looking at the numbers, it doesn't make sense. So it's, it's, it's very kind of sparsely, if you look at it, it will be very sparsely distributed when in actual fact it isn't. They're all concentrated along the west coast, uh, along the east coast with the indigenous population scattered in the, in, in the interior. So see, having this sort of a, a perspective, I would imagine that the government of India has uh, at one level, because it's just looking at the population of the demographics, saying, yes, we need to have more people on the island and we need to have a lot more different forms of development in the area because the, the place is completely underdeveloped. And that's true. The place is very, 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 very underdeveloped in very many ways. It has very rudimentary facilities, like you're aware, in terms of water, transport, communication, those basic facilities are really, really very, very rudimentary. And more importantly, even employment. So even if you have 8,000 people there, a lot of them are actually twiddling their fingers half the time, wondering what to do. And very few people, especially after the tsunami, have lost a lot of uh, land and very few people are actually engaged in, or have, rather have gone back to agriculture as a, a source of revenue or an income and so on. Uh, the minimal number of people are employed in private enterprise, a maximum number of people are employed in government services. And that's where the larger, I think the where this, this, this concern or rather the, the idea for a proposal to, has, to develop this area has kind of come about. In addition to this is also the, is, are two other reasons from what I've been given to understand when I'm speaking to other people as well, and from what I know. Uh, one is its strategic value in terms of, of a defense uh, a, a location for a strategic location for defense. And it's true again. Here you have an island, uh, Great Nicobar, which is located, um, or rather extends India's reach or arm eastwards and directly into Southeast Asia virtually. The Andaman is not so very much, but Great Nicobar is bang next to Southeast Asia and right there. And secondly, it is uh, the other part of it is that it is uh, strategic in terms of, it, of uh, maritime trade and very strategically, again, located exactly at the mouth of the Malacca Straits. And India is not earning any revenue from that being located so, so strategically and very well placed in that location. So I, want, I would like to kind of try and kind of counter these arguments which I have kind of our opinions that I've shared with you uh, in some, some ways. Uh, first, the population. Like Pankaj has very rightly pointed out, even though it's a very small population, now, sorry to talk about Port Blair. Port Blair has about a, maybe a couple of lakhs, lakh people living in Port Blair. Great Nicobar in all has 8,000 people. Even for those 8,000 people, water is still a scarce commodity today. So uh, yeah, we're just talking about a basic, simple issue in terms of inter as, as such as water, a very basic and fundamental resource that all of us require on our daily basis. 
that's not very easily available uh, in Great Nicobar and in adjoining uh, areas in that area. Despite it being a rainforested, uh, a, a place which is forested by rainforest and lots of rainfall, more, much more than Port Blair and the Andamans, the harvesting of rainwater takes place through check dams uh, primarily, and uh, the supply is very badly regulated and so on. So there are basically a lot of associated problems with this, this fundamental issue of basic drinking water. But apart from that, there are a whole host of other issues as well in terms of medical facilities and education and so on and so forth. And the basic infrastructure is there, but not, not reaching anywhere where it's, it's helping the local population kind of to move forward and kind of grow on their own. In fact, post-tsunami, you have a whole large number of people who have come from the outside, mostly from Bangladesh and from East Bengal, who have come into Great Nicobar and are now conducting the agriculture on a, uh, and even trade within the island and into Ireland as well. Uh, for short-term benefit. They're there for a short period of time on, on a, a short-term basis for a couple of years, maybe, and then they push off. So there's no, no real stake in, in their, their uh, input for the development of the island. So the other is the, in, in terms of issue of, or the issue of uh, uh, strategic value in terms of defense. And I've been told by, I mean, a couple of uh, people in the defense establishment as, as well as in the administration, and this is probably one of the primary and key uh, issues why there is, there is and or other a plan has been made to kind of bring about development in the area. The argument being that once you have more people in the area, there are more eyes and ears and so on and so forth, and you actually are occupying that parcel of land. And if you actually go back into Great Nicobar's history, uh, the reason why, one of the reasons, one of the reasons why it was uh, settled in the 1970s, late 60s, 1970s, was the apparent claim being made by Indonesia to the landmass of uh, Great Nicobar. And so very promptly, the government of India had brought in uh, ex-army uh, personnel who, were, who wanted land and who were agreeable to settle in the far-off location. And they were brought into Great Nicobar and eventually they, they were the first and first and foremost settlers of Great Nicobar. And this was, an, a, this was a bid and a successful bid to kind of actually claim, stake claim to ownership of the land, which technically and legally India, it came under India's jurisdiction post-independence. And uh, this was just a, an added means of kind of establishing one's presence. And so that's moving like three or four steps forward by, by increasing the, the number of people on the landmass. And... Uh, it will also bring in a lot, I mean, the, idea, the, the ideology being that by bringing in more people and bringing in a lot more uh, uh, issues in terms of, I mean, bringing in a lot more economic development in the area, there will be employment, there will be a lot of associated and kind of collateral developments will happen, which will employ a larger number of people in the landscape. And that apart, uh, the trade in terms of trade or other India's stake in terms of using the landmass of Great Nicobar as a very strategic position in the maritime trade route, being at the mouth of the Malacca Straits. All these factors are true in, in very many ways. Um, but the way it is being going is being uh, taken up or being, being shaped up is where I and a lot of other people as well, including all of us, many of us here, I'm sure, find that problematic. Now, um, in terms of strategic value, in terms of the defense, yes, India has um, an outpost there. INS Baz is the Indian naval, uh, the Andaman Nicobar Command's southernmost uh, outpost, in fact. And you have both the Air Force, the Navy, and the Army all stationed over there in whatever capacities they are. And there is, in fact, this, the, the proposed, or so part of the proposed area that is being staked for development is the Indra Point area in the southernmost tip which in actual fact originally was uh, granted or given, even though it wasn't claimed by the Air Force, Indian Air Force, to set up an air, force, an air, an, an air field uh, for their aircraft and so on. It never took shape. Um, there were also this was an argument at one point of time of having a linking road from the East Coast all along the West Coast so that people could travel, you could have heavy vehicles, uh, um, tanks and so on, if, if required to be able to travel and traverse this entire landscape, if there was any incursion and, and attempt to colonize or, or um, and so on. Now, all of this is nice to see on paper and talk in, in person, like without even actually being in the landscape. If you actually, and, and in actual fact, there was, and there still is the remnants of an east-west road, which at one point of time was cutting 
across the island from Campbell Bay on the on the east eastern side towards the west coast. And I have traversed the traverse that uh, track very often for work. It's very poorly navigable. Most of it has fallen landslides and so on. But the fact is that even the army and the Indian uh, naval naval establishment, about couple, there's a video which has been made of marine commandos being sent on a bare gorilla's kind of uh, uh, trip expedition from the east coast to the west. They were just sent out without the least amount of equipment, knife, and so on. It took them a couple of, a day or two to get get across. And it's very very tough terrain. They came across champagne and so on. It's, it, it cuts across champagne habitat. The champagne are the tribe who lives live in the forest. And um, all that said, all that said and done, the fact is you really don't need to have a tank or an army man or a, a naval ship. We are having to reach over there. You have the air force today. In today we are in 2021. We have the capability of kind of uh, knowing who's traveling where or other visualizing people kind of moving into different parts. So in, in, in the instance of uh, a national emergency for in terms of defense or war and so on, we have India definitely has the capability of being able to safeguard and protect Great Nicobar Island with all its means and even the minimal amount of means without having to have a road or a, a resort or, a, or a whatever cutting across the entire landscape. And this was an argument that a couple of colleagues and I had proposed to the government about 10 years ago, in fact, to be honest. Uh, 2012, if I'm right, we were sent to Great Nicobar to do an assessment and so on um, regarding this particular uh, facet, in fact. And this is what we stated, that you have the capability and, and the government actually agreed to it. But this argument has been, has been given a new form, new birth, new ideas, new people. It's just coming up again. The other issue of having a transshipment terminal, which Pankaj has written a lot about, um, and a couple of others also have written a bit, the argument stays that, yes, it, I mean, again, on paper, it is very ideally located. It is exactly at the mouth of Malacca Straits. And to build this huge transshipment terminal of 75,000 crores or whatever they're going to kind of put in, all the material will have to come from outside. Now, how much, how, what sort of sense does that make? When you, you have to ship every single thing. I was there when the tsunami 2004 had struck, and I was there afterwards, immediately afterwards. And I was there for about six, seven months at a stretch uh, on, the, on the island. Rocks, sand, every single, even nails had to come from outside. Rock and sand came from Malaysia and uh, Indonesia. It was brought in by ship. They were not, even for this transship and terminal, they're going to be bringing it from the mainlands of Southeast Asia, not, not the mainland India. Mainland India is much further up, up uh, I mean, further apart. Up, up, up. And so it does, I mean, what sort of economic sense does it make when the, in the amount of revenue that they're going to garner, when you already have very well established ports of Klang and um, Colombo and so on and so forth, which are actually are actually handling transshipment terminal traffic in those areas, how much is Great Nicobar going to be able to handle? And for what uh, purpose? The ships are already traveling and even Indonesia has off, off Sumatra. There are others, one being built by India, in fact, being, I mean, there's Indian assistance being built in uh, Sri Lanka, in uh, Sumatra. What are we trying to do? I mean, it's, it's, it's a, it, to me, it is, even though there are a, fair, a whole range of arguments that uh, the experts will kind of propose, it doesn't seem a very feasible idea because, and, and, and so have other people I have consulted, especially naval uh, and defense people who are well versed in these. Uh, uh, term and of these uh, disciplines, they say they, they themselves say this is a no-brainer. You have to import the, the amount of your costs of your input costs are going to be much more, much much more than your so-called benefits. The amount of benefits you're going to actually accrue from this entire uh, enterprise, if it if at all it reaches the level of an enterprise when it is completed, is going to be minimal. And you have to wait for many many more years for it to actually take fruit. And be able to overtake any uh, well-established township and terminal in other areas. Now, so it, it does it, that. That is what kind of makes us uh, makes us feel even more foolhardy, kind of to try and jump into the fray. And or I sometimes I used to wonder: Is this just a way of dumping some lot, lot of money that we have when we don't have water to drink and don't have a place to go and kind of uh, take a dump in the morning? Also, people, why are we kind of putting in money for for all all of this 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 sort of work in an island which is blessed with beautiful beaches, so many species of animals and, and wildlife that are existent there. There are excellent, I mean, excellent com communities who live in the forest and along, along that entire area, and just communities. So much to learn from them. We've barely even been able to communicate with those people. 
and establish some a better level of understanding. Even before we have done that, we haven't even been able to uh, translate and kind of transcribe what they know of their, their own landscape. What are we trying to do? We are colonists. It's not just a British empire, which is a, which is a colonizing empire. Here we are. India has a, has a colonizing entity there in Great Nicobar. And, and uh, we were, I was part of another subcommittee, uh, 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 which was set up with this Niti Aayog, again, through the government. It, that report is available online through the Andaman Nicobar Collective. It's the first episode, the only two episodes, one episode, the first episode has this uh, entire uh, report that we prepared as a video format. We were able to interview some Shampen people as well, both a man and a lady. And they were very, very clear. Don't come into our area. This is where we live. This is where we collect our food from. Don't bring people inside this area. We don't want, this is our land. They said that very, very clearly. Now, as far as I'm concerned, to, and for, for, as far as I can reckon rather, and I can say this openly, the entire exercise was a, probably just a, an eye wash. Is this procedure? Yes, we have done this. We have, I mean, there are boxes to tick. Have you done a, a, a report about the, what local people think? Yes, we have done it. But what they have said and what, it, what are you trying to implement, it makes no difference. It has no... I mean, it, it has no meaning at a at at, one, at a at a level. There's not not even a discussion about it at the moment. There's no there's no need to. They didn't even find the need to kind of or even consider the need to discuss these issues with, with people like us or even others from the island itself. So those are those are those are funny. What are we trying to do? Is it is in, in, in what we refer to as a kind of dem democratic setup? Why are we pushing? I mean, ourselves, in, I, I'm referring to the larger uh, nation state as, as ourselves. I mean, I, I think rightly so. But it isn't the nation state which is doing this. It's just a whole bunch of people who think or who are given, being given the uh, opportunity of being a think tank to... Uh, a forum and this venue. There was one member of the Niti Aayog who actually asked a very close friend, who are these Shampen people? Are they homo sapiens? And this is the level of understanding or this is the level of uh, uh, um, knowledge that we have about the, the island. There's nothing at all. They even refer mm -hmm. to a, 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 a community, an indigenous community. Are they asking if they're homosexual, if their people are actual people or not? They're not bothered. They're just not bothered. Yeah. Just steamroll their way into and say, yeah, this is where you're going to push your money and X, Y, Z can kind of set up and their enterprises and so on. It doesn't make sense. It makes sense at another level, but it doesn't make sense for local area development. There are so many other pressing issues that need to be, uh, can be very easily taken care of. You, I mean, mm -hmm. to actually develop Great Nicobar, give me 100 crores or even less than 100 crores. It's possible. It's very, very eminently possible. There's lots that one can do. And in fact, we what we I mean, suggested to the government as well, also at that point of time was, there are people who definitely have a great need of uh, in, uh, employment, of being able to have water to bathe in and drink and so on and so forth. Hey, this is, the list is endless. I don't want to get into that. But uh, to end, in fact, there's a very nice little video, uh, which I think the Nicobar Times has access to. Uh, Tarun Karthik will have access to. I saw it on, on, he sent it to me, in fact. It's by this guy, a guy called Oscar, uh, Ranchiwala, old settler, who is singing the song of, uh, and saying, there is, he's using a whole an old Hindi song, but he says, here we are in Campbell, in, they refer to us Campbell Bay. Okay, here we are in Campbell Bay, waiting for Chaura, or waiting for Moti, waiting for Sentinel to come. These are the names of ship. They never come. We're waiting for Alu and Piaz to come. This is the 21st century. Okay, waiting for Alu and Piaz to come. We don't have water to drink properly. What are we doing over here? But we love our Campbell. This is where we are. This is where we're going to stay. This is where we're going to be. And we have left such people out of, I mean, there's, no, there's, no, there's no regard for such kind of people such as Oscar at all. And I mean, not, we don't even. I mean, that's one level. The other level is the, is the indigenous community, people who are the original uh, owners or, or the uh, stakeholders in the, on the island. There's no concern at all. So that's that for me. To me, it's extremely worrying. I mean, if you don't have concern for these people, what are you going to do? There is just it's just another dump here. Dump your money, do what you want, and get the hell out of there. You're not bothered. What are those people going to do? What are the what are the, I mean, what happens to the wildlife? And to take it and to talk about wildlife, India's only nesting beaches which have leatherback uh, sea turtles nesting are in the Andaman Nicobar Island. And, and for those who don't know, there are very few beaches in the Andaman and Nicobar Island which actually are host, host, host to leatherback sea turtles. Very few. And that too, kind of fluctuating in most places, very few actually have a steady... Adit is here as well. He can, he's the fellow who is doing all this work. He can tell you very well. But 
it's it's a, it, and it's these are fascinating places and species for people to understand and know. It's a it's a great opportunity for for environmental education and I mean it, it, people see environment or ecology. I, I was talking to I mean on online or having a chat with one of a, a, a former former bureaucrat. So all you guys want is tigers and devil bats and whatnot. Those, other you bring that that kind of an argument doesn't hold water at all. It isn't about a devil yeah. bat. It isn't about a tiger. The fact is that all that comes along with it, all that kind of is is useful to people living in that area and for the species themselves. They all are interconnected in various ways. Let's look at it in that fashion, not looking at it as a tiger or a, or a leather bag. Yeah, of course. Mm -hmm. I mean, so I mean, let me stop here and can, you can carry on. Sorry. <laughs> no, thank you so much, uh, Manish. And I think actually between you and Sankar, you have covered so many aspects of what I wanted to talk about. And the the fact that everything is so interlinked, you know, you can't actually have separate categories and eight same questions to ask you about how to approach this because everything is so tightly interwoven there. It is a, it's actually a very small area, with, but it's a fascinating interacting system there. And so all of these issues are just cascading. You know, none, none, none of them stand alone or in isolation. So I think the fact that you all have had to go into such depth just to, you know, answer the preliminary questions tells us how uh, critical it is to have that kind of deep knowledge of what's happening. Um, and actually, a lot of questions have started coming in from our audience, and uh, some of them do overlap with questions I want to ask you about where we go from here. You know, the fact that uh, is there any way for us to oppose or critique these plans? Have they already begun? What can we do as uh, general public? What can be done by the locals? And there are some specific questions regarding that coming in from the audience. So I'm going to start taking them. Uh, you know, and Perhaps Pankaj could take the first question. Uh, it says, you know, you start talking about some of the ecological aspects of this as well. And a lot of these species are highly endangered and they are protected by the Wildlife Protection Act. So um, we have a question that asks, wouldn't it be illegal to destroy their habitat under these acts? And, you know, what is, how do we work around this? You know, is it that the Forest Department or the Tribal Welfare Association aren't holding as much authority over these areas as they used to. So, what exactly is happening here? So, the irony is that the law is only as as good as it is it is applied. And I mean, like I said in the beginning, we have a situation here where there was an existing wildlife sanctuary, or probably one or maybe of two of the kind which are. Uh, created under the Wildlife Act for marine sea turtle nesting. I mean, of course, we have a mainland India as well, but but in the islands, maybe Cutbird Bay uh, in the Andaman part and, and maybe Galatia in, were, were explicitly created for protecting nesting turtles. Of course, we have a lot of other beaches, like all of us know. But here you have a process in which the first step has been to denotify that sanctuary so that it does not, that element of the law does not come in the way of the port construction. So, I mean, this is a larger question of uh, uh, of law, of how it can be used. And uh, at one level, it goes into a much larger, can go into a much larger discussion of the relevance of the Wildlife Protection Act of India in many contexts. Of course, it has been beneficial and it has been used, but maybe by itself, it is not uh, enough. And we, we are seeing that here because it being notified a wildlife sanctuary uh, made no uh, made no difference. It, it just went ahead and it was denotified. Now the, the logic and the uh, and the critique of a lot of researchers and lawyers is that it is an illegal denotification by law. Yeah, but as of today, if you look at the paperwork, is all in place. They have followed so-called due process. There is a, a what what is believed to be due process. They have, uh, there is a proposal from the State Forest Department, then there is opinion from the Wildlife Institute of India, it is discussed in the Standing Committee of the National Board for Wildlife, and then the National Board for Wildlife, which is the body, uh, legal, legally mandated body, does say that yes, we will denotify the wildlife sanctuary. And what's interesting, and that's beside the point, and perhaps could be challenged if somebody does, is they say in their minutes that we are denotifying this for a transshipment port. There is no logical or environmental other reason. It is in so many words that if 
we have to denotify the sanctuary for a transshipment port, then we do this, this, and this, and we have a mitigation plan. So uh, we might argue it is illegal, but finally, when the process is followed, it, if it goes to court, and if the court depends on what the court will rule. Uh, so that, that is one dimension of the legality and the process. Uh, and there might be uh, other spaces. So one, I think, is the whole issue of uh, the legal protection. Others might be, I think, like Manish pointed out in a different way, is that whether this is really viable in the long in the long term or even in the short term. Uh, you know, economically, traffic-wise, logistically. Also, you know, uh, we didn't really discuss it, but this is a space that is tectonically extremely active. Yeah, we are seismic zone five. This place is maybe what 100 nautical miles uh, from the epicenter of the disaster of 2004. I mean, the tsunami and the earthquake. And the shift that took place in the land, I mean, the lighthouse in Indira Point today is in water uh, because of the subsidence that took place. And that was a phenomenal up to 15 feet. That's what geologists tell us. So, so there is also the need, uh, and why I'm saying all this, there's a need to highlight these concerns. Uh, I mean, if you look at some of the documents, including a WACOS uh, report, WACOS is a consulting agency that will, that will ask for consultants to then, then do certain um, outputs. Uh, so the, when they called for a consultancy for the port, uh, they actually quote in their call for proposals that Galatia Bay is a good site for the port because this place was not affected as much in the tsunami of 2004. It is scientifically incorrect because Indira Point, which is what, seven or eight kilometers south, saw subsidence of 15 feet one morning. So I think what is needed is uh, multiple uh, efforts, whether they're successful or not, I don't know, but multiple efforts at creating a much larger body of understanding and opinion. It could be ecological. For instance, very recently, and I sent it out and some of you may have seen it. I did a piece for The Wire as well. A lot of turtle biologists and organizations came and wrote a joint letter. It went to the chief secretary, it went to the lieutenant governor, it went to the Niti Aayog, it went to the environment ministry. And it matters. It matters because these are the people, and some of them have joined us on the conversation today, are the people who know what they're talking about. So similarly, because this is, uh, often we don't know what, what is there at stake. And, but at, on the other hand, I think all the information that is even there scientifically, geologically, uh, ecologically, where the human communities are concerned, I think it knows, needs to go out in that in the space. Uh, it inform the power maker, the, the power brokers, it will inform policy makers, it might inform the court, it will inform the public. And uh, whether we go to court or not, and whether the court takes action or not, I think hopefully that will also happen. But, but creating this larger body of awareness is in some sense the only thing we have in hand as it is. Yeah? There, there are limitations to go to court, there are limitations to what we can write, but each one where they are and each one where he and she is, I think, uh, so in terms of what we can do, there are these three or four things. I mean, one thing that we have been doing now is to get a whole set of people to file RTIs. So this piece, uh, you know, about what, what, what I've just written and is appearing tomorrow most likely is actually an RTI filed with the WII asking for their justification of saying that it is okay to build a port in Galatia Bay. And it's very interesting what the WII response in the, uh, uh, in the RTI replies, it's WI officially says we have no expertise or experience working with leatherbacks in the Andaman and Nicobar ecology. It is partly incorrect, but what's interesting is for the institution to say that we don't have expertise, but then they're also saying in an official meeting that it's okay to denotify that sanctuary. Now, unless we have this information with us and other kinds of information, uh, we will not be able to respond. So building up the information base building up that capacity and understanding, I think is going to be key to point out, for instance, that is it really worth the risk of this investment in such a seismically active zone? Uh, what will happen to those 35, 40,000 crores or 50,000 crores when there's another earthquake and another tsunami? What is the risk to investment? What is the risk to people? So, I mean, these are some of the things that perhaps we have to do. And I think the, the importance of knowledge and awareness Maybe more people should write about it in their platforms. It need not be national media. It could be blogs. It could be smaller communities. 
So all of us who have worked there, I mean, I like this, like this session that you put together. I think every small step will contribute in my opinion. Thank you, Pankaj. Uh, I think you covered some really important points, including the fact that it is a uh, seismically vulnerable zone and we've seen devastation there previously. And considering the amount of resources being pumped in to develop this island to this extent, I mean, this is, it also feels like a much larger scale of what has been seen once where the initial settlers who came in, like Manish was saying, in the late 60s, early 70s, spent a good 30 years putting the island together, developing it, and one tsunami came and they had to start from scratch. And the devastation is going to be so much more considering the kind of um, investment being poured in at the moment. Um, so that also brings me to kind of ask you, you know, building this knowledge base is going to take time. Uh, fighting this is going to take time. Uh, educating people, doing more webinars like this, and actually being able to build up enough of a support or enough critique to actually pause this process and you know get people to rethink what is happening here is again you know, going to take time and like you were saying earlier that you know the local population is just 8500 people and in the larger scheme of things that's a minuscule number of people whose voices while important perhaps may not be as important to larger governing bodies or authorities who have the power to go ahead with these so where are we right now in terms of this de these proposed developments? Has it started? When is it going to be starting? Has construction you know, already been set in place? Uh, what is the timeline that we're looking at? Uh, either of you could answer. Pankaj, you probably have a little better place to uh, speak on that. Yeah, so uh, see, the thing is that, uh, to the best of my knowledge, uh, nothing has started on the ground. Because it is still, uh, although that, that north-south road is, uh, and I think it's gone past, uh, uh, the latest I know is that it's gone past the river uh, Galatia. So they've tried to build a bit of a... No, it hasn't, bridge. Bridge. it hasn't gone, gone past. Huh? I think it hasn't. The temporary bridge has gone past. But, but that, that, that is a small thing. Yes. They have built something uh, in recent... It's not a permanent structure. Yeah, it's a wooden thing is going across the thing or partly. Is it? I, have, I, have, I have images. Okay. Uh, I'll share them with you. Uh, so, but, but I mean, that, that's not uh, such, such an important thing where this is concerned. Uh, so it hasn't really taken off because it is still in a sense uh, in the proposal and the clearance phase. Uh, and, and it's interesting also uh, for us to educate ourselves on what the processes are. And for me, it has been an education because what comes first, what are the clearances required? What are the concerned bodies in the government locally and nationally that will uh, give permission. So, you know, also educating ourselves on that is, I think, very important. So, as far as to quickly kind of uh, give a gist is that there is a, uh, I mentioned the ACOM report. So, there is a pre feasibility report uh, that has been uh, produced. It's a 126 page report that lays out the broad sketch of what is proposed. This is in the public domain. It can be accessed. I can send it to people. And this uh, in March and then in April, uh, so this was the first formal document uh, that is, in a sense, being proposed for development by the Andaman and Nicobar administration. That's very important to keep in mind because the project proponent is, is ENITCO, which is the Andaman and Nicobar Islands Industrial Development Corporation. Actually, this is technically it is their project. It is not a project of the Niti Aayog. It is not a project of the ANN administration. It is ENITCO's project. They are the ones that are sending in reports and requests for clearance to the ministry. So that's what they did in March. Uh, and one of the main submissions was this project report, which goes to something or went to something called the Environmental Appraisal Committee Infrastructure One, uh, which is the legally mandated. Just, just give me a moment. I have somebody on the door. So uh, just, just a moment. Yeah. Being alone at home has its challenges. Yeah. Sure, sure. No problem. Manish, maybe you can... Uh... Continue yeah, a little so, bit. Like he was yeah. saying, Enetco is the body that is kind of uh, uh, being given the mandate of carrying out these developmental projects, the Andaman Nicobar Integrated Developmental uh, Corporation. And um, despite being an Andaman Nicobar Integrated Development Corporation, the ideas are largely from the NITI. That this has been kind of um, set in place because they are the, like seen as a think the, the entire, if you do a, do a kind of draw a schema, the NITI is at the top. 
where it's like a, it's, it's the equivalent of the planning commission and they give up these uh, grandiose ideas of uh, a blueprint in some senses and uh, the implementing agency is another agency which is a local body wherever it is and then it can it go is the implementing agency now i mean i'll, I'll leave pankaj to kind of continue where he he was he started off from but to kind of add to what he was saying of what we can do etc is also this there are a couple of issues one is of, of educating even local people local communities um like i said earlier on there is a huge and great need for bringing about a various sets of changes in um great nikobar itself there is a huge need it is back of beyond in very many ways and needn't to be needn't be back of beyond it can continue to be great nikobar and continue to be a place where people continue to live both indigenous and the, and the settlers and so on but with this sort of a developmental ideology or a developmental plan which is which many people so many, lots of experts is going to fall flat on its face that has to be kind of reworked and rethought about there has to be an assessment of this entire ecom uh, proposal so that's one one apart from what pankaj has been has already said of of talking writing and uh, interacting and sharing ideas with other people there also has to be an independent inquiry into the into the into the feasibility of this entire enterprise this enter, entire uh, developmental plan because see at various levels the local communities are at like i said i've always been insisting they definitely do need development and they also are very is blinded by this this image of saying yes we we are going to be able to kind of bring about change in our in our area without realizing the amount of impact of a tsunami of people are going to come in or there and where they will be eventually located and or, or dislocated at another level in many years from from now all right pankaj carry on you were saying you were speaking yeah you know that's a good point so so uh, so just to kind of run through the kind of front stage and there's lots of very interesting things happening backstage which we don't know and which are very shady in some senses i mean we have some knowledge but that we can discuss separately so uh i also just to point that what you know it's, it's very interesting dynamics that while the niti ayog has piloted this formally niti ayog says we have nothing to do there is actually an rti response from the niti ayog saying that we are a consulting agency and we have no plan for great nikobar in some senses and so it, it is why they would do that is something that's very interesting and and they are saying it's completely a i spoken to journalists who have spoken to niti ayog people and they say no, we are a consulting and advising agency it's all being done by the andaman administration if you have questions you go there we don't know anything about it that's what they have said formally and informally to journalists who have written about it that is what they have said in an rti response but just coming back to what's happened is so this report uh, formally first came to the uh, this environmental appraisal committee in april and they have looked at it and actually they have raised a large number of questions but they have then uh, what is the technical term is they have recommended it for grants of tor terms of reference which in some senses if i understand right is the first step to now say now go and do your environment and social impact assessments and uh, so in some senses there is an in principle approval for uh, for this thing to go ahead nothing can happen on the ground unless for whatever it's worth these uh, environmental and social impact assessments are then done and we still don't know whether uh, that has begun or how they are going to do that or what is the mechanism but that is where uh, this is located at this point of time so i think there is a window where uh, where they, they they should be doing all these things and they should be doing a rigorous job to the extent that they can do which might be very difficult in the circumstances that you know the islands are and they are not easy to access uh we don't know much anyway and they are working on a lot of wrong information by for example saying that um, there was no impact of the earthquake and tsunami of 2004 etc etc and while i've been sort of india saying that they don't know anything about like back to turtles and saying yes and giving the go ahead yeah so i mean you know there are many many things like that exactly exactly so i think it, it is very important to uh, we have to figure out mechanisms depending on interest and depending on uh, mandates of individuals and institutions to track these processes what is happening who is going to do the eia if the eia comes up and we have a draft or a final report do we have a good scientific response that will challenge some of these things to say that this information is incorrect and that we have evidence that this is you know xyz so i'll just say one thing is i think in this case uh, going back to your first question ishika is that you know it takes time knowledge is not enough but we know little bit about 
Great Nicobar. I mean, there is there's some knowledge, and maybe there's more about Great Nicobar than perhaps the other islands in this in this entire group. That's point number one. It is important to put it together. I think I'm seeing that there is a lot more uh, that can be consolidated, perhaps as as evidence. The second thing, you know, is is interesting for for good reason in some sense. We are lucky that we have a bit of a heads up on this particular project. It is not a situation where things have started off on the ground, uh, which is which is in many cases what happens, and then we are the people who are concerned in the way that they are then are reacting. We have been able to kind of inter you know understand this and get a sense of it even as it is beginning. Already clearance will happen, so it's not like it's not done, but nothing has happened on the ground. So we have maybe a bit of a head start in understanding what is happening, and if we keep tracking this. Uh, and building up other solidarities and other uh, interests, uh, then maybe uh, maybe there is hope. And at the end of the day, and I think like Manish said in the very beginning, this does not seem to be in our even even in my limited understanding from maritime technique and uh, economics and other things, the logistics, it does not seem a very feasible thing. So maybe it will die a natural death. Uh, but but we can't wait for that. I am very clear this project does, should not come up. Uh, and uh, one has to make an effort at uh, at challenging it at multiple levels, uh, and, and I'm saying multiple levels because it's not necessary that it will only work if we fight it at one particular level. It has to be local. It has to be in Port Blair. It has to be in Chennai, Bombay. It has to be maybe in Parliament, maybe in the courts, maybe at the Niti Aayog level, maybe in the ministry, and all of them. So I think there's a lot that can be done, and I think we'll all learn along the way as well. Thanks, Pankaj. Um, I think, you know, considering we're also slightly short on time and we have covered a lot of aspects of what I was hoping to talk about, uh, one common theme of questions which has been coming up from our audience is, of course, what the layman can do. You know, how do people contribute? And I think that uh, one definite, uh, you know, one clear path that we know is that we need to educate ourselves, you know, this is something you've already taken the first step, anyone who's in the audience, even just by coming for this webinar, because you come here trying to seek more knowledge about what is happening, and that's a great first step. Uh, but what next? What do we do beyond this? You know, um, and both of you could answer, uh, and perhaps uh, also say any last comments about the topic which we may not have covered as yet. Uh, Manish, would you like to go first? Yeah, I mean, we, we've actually covered a fair amount of ground on this. Uh, and like, I, I'll go back to the, the issue of saying, um, of fact-checking. What, even if they are governmental advisory bodies or whoever else they may be, like, for instance, what Pankaj mentioned of the uh, Wildlife Institute saying that they, they don't have information about leatherbacks and they're not clear about it. Or not. I mean, as part of INET, we began the, the leatherback monitoring work in by way back in the year 2000. That's about 20 odd years ago, actually. And there was a gap of about seven year, odd years where uh, and continues for that, that particular location. But the initial three years of data that's there and subsequently in the forest department maintained a record and so on, that information is available. And we really, everybody knows that Great Nicobar and other places are very important uh, spaces for the leatherback sea turtle. And having a, 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 a port or even a breakwater in the area, whatever, is going to be damaging to those species. So let's not, let's not, let's not fool ourselves. It's simple logic. It's a simple and very clearly well-established information. Who are we fooling? We're only fooling ourselves by saying, you know, this can happen, that can happen. Whether the Wildlife Institute of India or Wildlife Institute of Tambaram or whatever it may be, wherever it is. The fact is, you can't fool us. I mean, it's it's who are you fooling? That's one. And about this transshipment terminal, and I don't know if you mentioned it, this is not the first time it's come about. And this proposal or this idea, this concept of having a transshipment terminal in Great Nicobar was there about 30 years ago. And every every five odd years of planning, when it used to, would come up or pop its head up, when the ex, the experts of those years, when they were consulted, they had a very clear answer. This is not not feasible because of X Y Z reasons. And those those reasons still hold hold ground. It's not just ecology and environment; it is economics. That's not, the, the, everybody tends to see leatherbacks as the bad boy here, or Pankaj and Manish or whoever else are the bad boys saying, no, don't bring development here. No, it's economics. It's plain Jane economics. How, I mean, what are you, if just pumping in 75,000 crores, great. Pump it into great, you know, bury it in a little handi or whatever, do what you want to do. But the point is, in the long run, in the long term, 
what are local communities they're going to benefit from and what do they i mean what, what, there are so many needs that are there that need to be fulfilled and that can be done without having a township and town you can have a full range of other developmental ideologies and projects none of us are saying don't develop the area none of us are saying that like i've said in the in, in the start that area needs development but not this form of development there are there are opportunities for local communities to expand or 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 or, or uh, improve on economic income generating opportunities for the local community education medical facilities roads networks etc etc the champagne itself i've been part of the committee who has been working with the community and the, 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 the that same very same community how much do we know them i've been party to that uh, right academic policy about the champagne how much do we know about them i can tell you this much this much we know about them and they can be xyz who says yeah i have done a phd or whatever on the champagne and so on and so forth sorry that information is is very very kind of uh, whitewash virtually and we very sadly lost a guy called akam he was one of the boys in uh, chinge he was willing to go with us and intercede or in, intervene or with the champagne in the interior he unfortunately hung himself for a couple of years because of depression uh, from chinge only we know very little about these companies what are we trying to do with them by just kind of bulldozing our way in those areas the fact is there's so many beautiful things that can kind of take shape in that area lots of beautiful things can kind of be developed in that area it can i mean forget the singapore or hong kong it can be a great nicobar model of development why are we talking about maldives or singapore or hong kong or seychelles why can't we talk about a great nicobar model of development where a developmental idea ideology beyond all of this can take shape i think that's important and that's what we need to kind of be able to help local communities in both great nicobar and the andamans realize and understand as well not just saying a leather bag or a padok we got to fall down or whatever and so on and so on. of course those are the standard arguments but the very fact is the long term impact of all of this is going to impact all the entire area the entire landmass very very bad and because because i mean to again say very plainly the planning has taken place from delhi with statistical mm-hmm. reports and records from xyz kind of books that have been published or reports that have been published i know for for a fact that there are lots of books that have been come about about great nicobar which are factually wrong as well or they've been published because they've been collected from multiple sources and put together as a book as well there is that is that that's that's the, unfor- that's the unfortunate uh, state of affairs and but there are lots of people who are available to provide any information that we ha- are able to share and so on so forth and that's easily available within the country so we don't need we don't need to go to maldives or to seychelles or wherever else the ideology is there so and i mean that's one of the thing and, uh, and pankaj has covered a lot of other other stuff of uh, rpis and so on and so forth yes those are all very very important he's been doing a great job of kind of sharing information or keeping it going through a writing article that's important as well whoever you are wherever you are whatever you can write and i mean the fact is this is unfortunate fact is very few people know about that that bans and anyway so anything else yeah. so ishika i have just taken the liberty of posting a set of the links of the, the articles i mentioned in the chat box so uh, yes, i am interested you. please do look it up because it will give you a sense of what we been discussing and has some of the you know the data that uh, manish and i have been talking about and uh, yeah i mean yeah so um, yeah that i just thought i'd bring that to the attention of everybody yeah. yes thank you so much for sharing that and that is actually a great uh, resource for anyone interested in knowing more not just about what is happening and what the consequences of it may be but i'm um, just written so extensively on what you can do as citizens and uh, what i will also do is uh, share all of you these sources via email with everyone who is registered and come for this webinar and uh, any other resources comfort if you would like us to forward to the audience today more than happy to do so um so i'm going to close with the questions uh right now since we have crossed our one hour mark but i am so uh, happy in uh, to see how much engagement came through uh, in this webinar how many people wrote in with questions and i guess it's it's a bit of hope to know that people will care enough to engage with some of these topics and ideas right now uh thank you so much manish and pankaj i know that it's very hard to fit in everything that we want to talk about and the true extent of the consequences of what could be uh in just one hour and uh, you've done incredible justice to that so thank you so much thank you shika thanks to cws for organizing this and 
let's hope. I, I mean, we have to have hope, and I think we we will we manage. All of us, if we get together. <laughs> yes, thank you, Vishika, and thank Thanks. you, Akshay, as well, and CWS, all of you, and Pankaj for sure. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, thanks so much. And uh, all of you uh, who tuned in to listen to us today, uh, do continue to engage with us. If you have any questions, uh, you know, feel free to write to us at the uh, ID which is flashing on your screen right now. Um, and keep an eye out for future webinars. We'll keep trying to talk about relevant topics. And uh, yeah, thanks so much for joining us today.